Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, second MDU webinar on uh, complaints. Uh, thank you for um, joining us. Um, now, complaints can be a, a difficult part of practice and they can be really time consuming and distressing to all concerned. And the purpose of today is to um, perhaps give you some more confidence in how to deal with complaints. Um, there's a lot of information on our website about complaints and I'm not going to go into the detail of the, the background legislation on complaints. This differs in each of the jurisdictions in the UK and I encourage you to look at that information um, as some areas can be quite technical. Um, the idea here um, is, is really to give you uh, more of an idea to how, to how to handle a complaint when you get it and, and also just to really um, get you to think about how to get it right the first time when you respond to a complaint because that can often be very helpful in stopping it escalating and also reducing um, the overall time you spend dealing with these. So um, without further ado, I'll start with a presentation. Uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible and you'll have a question box on your right so that um, you can um, ask, you know, type questions through that. If you can't see it, there's a little red arrow that you can press that should bring the control panel up. And there are a few polls and things we get you to vote on and a couple of scenarios that um, I'll ask you to consider and to uh, share your thoughts on. So um, we'll now make a start. Um, so, the idea of today is, is to take a fairly broad view of complaints. Um, we're going to have a look at um, a couple of scenarios, but first of all, I want to talk a little bit about why it's important to get it right, talk a little bit about identifying complaints, because I think that's, that's an important aspect as well, and also spend quite a bit of time talking about how you should respond and a little bit about how to avoid complaints. And that's the question that, that of course, um, most people have quite understandably. And I guess the other aspect of this that um, you, should clear, you should make clear is that, that you know, we, we can expect to receive a number of complaints during our careers. Um, and, and you know, that's part of practice. And, and often it's more how you deal with complaints rather than having received one that, that is uh, really important. Um, so, to move on from that, um, the MDU was, if we look at last year, we had over nearly 11,000 uh, complaints notified by MDU medical members. Um, and the commonest themes were delayed diagnosis and communication. Um, if, an I can I, if I can ask you now just to have a bit of a, a guess and vote and, and let me know what percentage of complaints were related to the top one, namely delayed diagnosis. Great, thank you very much for that. And, and the um, most of you, uh, or sorry, the, the majority of people, 42% um, got that answer right because in fact it was um, it was 31% of our complaints related related primarily to a delayed diagnosis. Now that, that's unsurprising because a lot of our members are in primary care and general practice, and of course the issues that arise from that really relate to a delay in diagnosis or, or a concern about a referral or something similar to that. Communication was only the lead issue in 15% of complaints, but the point I'd make about that is it, it was a, a secondary issue or an issue that perhaps was an aggravating factor in, in a significantly larger proportion than that. So central message is that good communication uh, can avoid um, complaints is, is, is still really um, right. Um, well, why is it important to get complaints right? Well, well, most of our members, when they contact us, will, will say to us, look, you know, I want to explain what happened to this patient. I don't know. They quite understand exactly what happened. I think we got this bit right and this bit not quite right. Um, and, and, you know, that's, of course, important. Um, there is, of course, a lot of interest in the, in the statutory duty of candor, which has applied to general practice now since the 1st of April this year. Again, there's information on our website about that. And of course the GMC for a long time has had an obligation on its members to provide um, an explanation, an apology if appropriate where things go wrong. The other thing that, that you may or may not have heard of before is, is this issue of what we would term multiple jeopardy. And, and that is simply that a single clinical incident can result in multiple different processes becoming active. For example, things might start 
life as an NHS complaint, but it may go on to a disciplinary investigation, even sometimes a criminal court trial or a GMC hearing or a coroner's inquest. And I have had on rare occasions cases where essentially all of these uh, issues have arisen from a single clinical incident. And the importance of um, writing a response to a complaint and writing any report in general is, is that, that really your, your account um, fundamentally must be the same for each process and if you prepare a response you really should um, you know be happy to to rely on it on, on any of these processes so um, you know it's, it's important to, to get it right even if it seems a relatively minor issue to begin with um, so it, it might sound like a very simple thing but I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know identifying what a complaint is now it's one of those things that, that you can say that, look, we all recognize a complaint when we see it, uh, and sometimes it can be a little bit hard to define. I don't think we should be any more complicated than, than saying that it's an expression of dissatisfaction that requires a response. Um, of course, um, practices are encouraged, often will get comments and concerns, and will often have those directly expressed to us. Um, um, a lot of our, our members ask us about what constitutes a formal and an informal complaint. And as I said, I won't talk in too much detail about the complaints regulations themselves, but the, 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 the statutory framework for complaints doesn't really look at it in this way. What it says is, look, there are complaints that fall under these regulations and that you must handle in accordance with them, so those for shorthand may be considered formal. The only ones that don't fall in that are, into that are oral complaints, that are a result of the satisfaction of a complainant within one working day. So a formal complaint can be an oral complaint, it can be a written complaint, it can be an email. The only thing that falls outside those regulations are oral complaints, so where somebody comes up to the desk and says, look, I'm unhappy about this, and somebody can, can deal with the issue straight away and, and, and diffuse it. Now, therefore, it is important that you train and empower frontline staff to recognize complaints and also deal with them when appropriate. Of course, there'll be some where it's, it's not appropriate and it should pass through your, your normal um, procedures. The other thing to say is that, is that um, you know, if it's within their competence, then giving an honest response on, their, on the spot to deal with that is, is, is entirely appropriate. There's no, no sort of problem with that. Um, everything else really does fall under your formal procedures and warrants a, a formal response. The other point I'd make is that this is linked but separate to um, the issue of, of significant event analysis and your governance procedures. Of course, a complaint may activate the governance procedure, but equally you may have uh, a, a gripe at the desk which is not maybe very serious but one that you've heard frequently and that you want to apply your governance procedure to. So bear in mind that they are linked and often learning from SE investigations can feed into responses to complaints but, but, but be aware of them not being sort of um, um, the same thing. Well, Having done that introduction, what I want to do now is to talk a little bit about how to respond to a complaint. So this is where I'll open it over to you now and say, look, what do complainants want? Um, so if I can ask you to use your, your chat boxes and um, let me know what you think about this. Um, you know, what sort of things do you think are helpful to a complaint response? Uh, what do you think complainants are looking for? Um, and any other thoughts you've got on that? So I've got here from Emma an explanation of what happened, uh, an honest and open apology. Uh, I'm sorry from there, say, and some saying yes, money, that, that can certainly be, be the case. Re reassurance that it won't happen again. Yes, I think that's another theme. Uh, we've got a few saying that they may be, be after financial compensation too. Um, and others reflecting that in terms of perhaps a remedy, um, want an honest response to their problem, or, or want satisfaction that, that, um, that, that the issue has been resolved. Uh, and again, the issue of reassurance that it, that it won't happen again. So I think those are all really important themes. Uh, and of course, they can be, be, be difficult sometimes to satisfy. We've got, we've got reassurance uh, here as well. Um, that the concern has been heard, etc. So I think that, that those are all very, very sensible suggestions and very helpful. So 
I think the core of these, whatever else um, a complainant may be seeking, whether what's written or unwritten, then an explanation is really a core to that. And again, you've got to think about that, not only in terms of how you answer the complaint, but how you investigate it in order to be able to, to provide that explanation. There is an issue that people want their complaint to feel heard, and an apology is certainly there. And, and often there are, there are requests that they don't want it to happen to somebody else, and sometimes that's a, 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 a sensible and realistic thing. Other times it's not. But feedback on improvements to the service can, can, can certainly be help and a willingness to put things right. Um, they also kind of, and I think you've articulated this in your responses, is, is want to know that the practice has taken ownership or the person who's, who's complained about has taken ownership of it and is dealing with the, with the complaint and the issues um, within it. Um, the things that generally cause, cause difficulty in complaints is that, is that um, you know, a response that, that denies or trivializes the, the issues the complainant has, has raised um, is, is very unlikely to resolve a complaint. Now, it, you know, it, it's often the case that um, you know, some, a complaint may contain elements of, uh, that, are, that are relatively trivial from a medical sense. It's still important, though, to be able to deal with those in the response, and often they're relatively straightforward to deal with. Um, but it's important to make sure that, that, that all of the points complainants raised has been dealt with. Um, again, it, it, the things that also tend to aggravate complainants tend to be where um, you know, there is a perception that, that the response is trying to blame the complainant. Now, of course, that can be quite difficult where a complainant has done something that has perhaps contributed to, to an adverse outcome or something similar. And normally, there is a way that we can deal with that, and, and we're certainly happy to review responses where you think, gosh, how do I address this? And normally, just a clear factual scenario um, does does you know help that? Um, so that's 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 the other thing I would say. Excuses again, things can be somewhat difficult in in that um, of course sometimes things happen that are outside the control of um, the person who's complained about. But again, a factual explanation explaining how the system works can be helpful um, in, in you know in terms of dealing with that. Um, there's also an issue of multiple procedural stages, and I, I raise that again because it, it relates to uh, another aspect of um, complaints handling that, that did change when, when the complaints procedure was updated in 2009, and, and that's really that um, before we used to have three stages. We used to have local resolution where a complaint was made to the practice or the hospital. Uh, then there was a, a stage of the healthcare commission and then the ombudsman. Now, the, the changes that were made in 2009 did two important, or did three important things. Firstly, it got rid of the Healthcare Commission, so essentially there are two stages, local resolution, and now the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman does the, the task of independent review. Um, and the other thing it imposed was a thing called the duty of cooperation, which meant that where a patient had concerns about multiple different aspects of their care given by, by different providers, those organizations had a duty to cooperate to liaise to provide a coordinated response to the complainant. It doesn't mean that if you're peripherally involved you must lead that process. It might be appropriate for another organization to lead it and for you to contribute. Um, but, but that's a really important change. Um, and of course complaints now can be made for the commissioner or provider of services. So essentially um, normally the complainant can go to the NHS provider, the hospital, um, or the general practice, or indeed a private sector provider providing NHS care, or they can go to whoever's commissioned that service, and it's normally NHS England that, that fulfills that role. So again, when you're thinking about constructing a response, you know, be sympathetic in your tone, take time and seek advice from your defence organisation, come, come to us and we can certainly help you do that. You know, where it's appropriate, express a regret for what's happened and apologize where something's gone wrong. Um, and, and, and don't phrase things in, 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 in the issue of blame. We can, um, you know, we can certainly help you get across those awkward points when you think, look, there is something we need to come out. I don't know the complainant will like the answer to this. There's usually a way of setting up that factual scenario, but, but dealing with that in a sensitive way. It can be helpful to discuss things with your peers or an independent colleague, and that's particularly helpful for clinical complaints where, you know, 
you know, say for example, where, where you have a classic miss such as a missed appendicitis or a chest pain that was misdiagnosed, then it can be difficult for a patient to, to understand how, you know, a significant condition was missed. And having um, the reassurance that it's had review by an independent clinician can be, can be helpful. The other thing I would say is address each point raised in the complaint. Of course, you should focus on the things that are the most important, but make sure the other aspects are dealt with as well. That's to do with making sure even things that seem trivial are dealt with and the complainant feels heard. And where there are relevant learning points then and changes that have resulted, do feed that back. Now, I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, and that is that, um, you know, where, you know, not all complaints will have relevant learning point, points, often they will, and wh when they're there, try and make them specific to the complaint and the response and link them together. I think bland statements such as, you know, we'll learn from this or changes will be made or we'll make sure this won't happen again, can sometimes be reassuring, but more often than not, complainants are now very sophisticated and will we'll sort of, you know, often come back to you and say, well, what's changed? What's going to be different? So try and make it specific. The other thing to say is, of course, if you indicate that you are going to make some changes, make sure they're implemented in a timely fashion. Um, I've certainly seen cases where a complaint will come back after six months and say, look, can you tell me how you're getting on with those changes you reassured me would, would take place? And of course, if the complainant is escalated to the ombudsman, uh, then the ombudsman might also take into account whether any issues that have arisen have been remedied and dealt with. The other thing that can sometimes be helpful is an offer to meet to discuss things further. Um, you know, it's not always appropriate, complainants don't always want that, but sometimes it can be helpful when particularly you think that um, written correspondence, you know, might have been at cross purposes and you're, you're risking that sort of chain of correspondence where, you know, perhaps both sides aren't, aren't quite understanding the other's perspective and sometimes a meeting can be a really good way of, of dealing with that. Um, there's a few things I'll put here because we do still see rare instances of this. You know, complaints are stressful and they all give us a single feeling when we have them, but don't panic when you get a complaint. As I said, they are a part of practice, whatever sort of work you do. Don't amend previous notes. You know, even a completely inadequate note is better than one that's been amended. Um, uh, and if you, if, if there's, uh, you know, material that needs to be added to records at a later point, and make sure it's clear when that was that was added and, and the amendment that was made. You know, don't go back in, in the face of a complaint and attempt to add to record. That's very unhelpful. Don't disparage a colleague. It's perfectly reasonable to give a factual account of the involvement that others have in their care. Or, so, for example, refer to, you know, discharge summaries you've received or letter correspondence from a colleague. Um, but again, try and deal with that in a factual way. Um, the other thing is, we'd say generally try and avoid responding without seeing the notes because often there's a time pressure with complaints, either from the complainant or because um, the, the complaints correspondence has been going through an organisational process and it will come to you relatively late. And, and do take time to review the records because the, the, the thing that, that can be really unhelpful is if you say something that isn't quite compatible with the records, then you know, the complainant can pick up on that and can infer a conspiracy when, when you know, it's just a simple mistake and it can be very, very difficult to undo. And, and you know, certainly I have seen cases where somebody's with, with all the best intentions has tried to respond very quickly um, and, and it's taken a long time for them to sort of undo uh, a minor error that, that's happened in that or, or sometimes a more significant issue. So, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of scenarios here that have been deliberately chosen and that they can, um, you know, reflect practice in the hospital sector or in general practice. And they're fairly straightforward scenarios and there's no sort of catches or tricks in these. So, I'll bring them up on screen and I'll go through them and I'll ask you to, to you know, I'm going to obviously ask for your thoughts on this in due course. Um, but the first one is a complaint from the family. So. Um, this is uh, a person writing saying, I'm writing to complain about the confusion and delay we experienced recently when my 79-year-old mother attended the ward. My mother became unwell and she was seen by a young doctor who took a cursory glance at her and said that she would prescribe antibiotics for a chest infection. She was then discharged. Later that day, my mother became so ill that I had to call the emergency doctor who admitted my mother to the hospital straight away. So, you know, 
this isn't a, a particular complaint, but it's one that's got all the sort of elements that we've had, that, that we often see, that a, a person's made an assessment and subsequently, as often happens, a patient's condition will change. Um, usually they tend to get better, sometimes people get worse and they need further care. So that's, that's the complaint. But I'll put it to you to say, look, what are your thoughts? And I guess the, to, to give you a bit more direction here, I'd say, look, what are your thoughts about the complaint itself? How do you think you'd go about investigating it? Are there any other things in terms of handling the complaint and responding to it that, that strike you? So I'll go back now and put up the scenario so you can continue to look at it, and I'll give you a minute or two to um, put your thoughts through. So we've got one comment here saying, look, look at the notes, and I think that's, that's very sensible. You know, you, you've got to see what happened. Is this an accurate reflection of the act, act, uh, the assessment that, that took place? And we've got, you know, talk to the doctors and nurses. Important to see how the first cons consultation went, gather statements. You know, uh, the point said that, that yep, yeah, there is a potentially a lack of communication here. You know, was the safety to advice? And the key question raised here, was the initial investigation adequate? You know, were the systems issues? This is a common scenario in overcessed systems. I've got from Charlotte there. I think that's sensible. Um, you know, an apology, review the notes to investigate it properly. I think a lot of you uh, are, are raising those points of, look, we need to find out what happened here and look at the records and do a proper investigation. I think that's sensible. Got a question here about safety netting advice uh, and offer a meeting. I think one, one point here that is actually very sensible is, um, is the patient actually um, complaining or is it just the relative? It's important to know who to address, and I think that, that too is absolutely right. Um, and talk to your consultant and other people involved in the treatment. So I think um, we've got a lot of really helpful thoughts there. And these are the issues that we thought from it. This is certainly not a, an exhaustive list. In terms of handling a complaint, the one issue that's in there is, is the issue of consent and confidentiality. Does the patient consent to this complaint? Or I guess more technically, we could say, does the patient um, give her authority for her for her daughter to complain on her behalf. And this can be difficult because, of course, it is very important. Um, you still have the same duty of confidentiality. It's important that you know that the person complaining has the authority to do that. But, of course, it can be tricky because people can see that as a delaying tactic, um, you know, in, in you not wanting to respond. And things like this are important that, that, that if you're involved in the handling of complaints, that the issues such as this are identified when the complaint letter comes in, so you can acknowledge it appropriately. For example, explain that you'll need to, to get the consent of the, of the patient, but also providing some reassurance that it won't delay in you starting to investigate the complaint. And of course, in a situation like this, it's helpful um, if those things are done so that when the consent comes back, you're in a position to, uh, to issue a response. Um, so, you know, just to develop that a little bit more, talking about, you know, who can write a complaint, of course the person who is treated can complain to the patient can complain, any other person can bring a complaint um, on behalf of a patient who's, who's authorised to do that by them, so it can sometimes be their MP, it can sometimes even be a solicitor, but it's commonly another family member. And again, another person can bring a complaint on behalf of someone who's died, on behalf of a child who lacks capacity, or, uh, and again, an adult patient who, who lacks capacity as well. And again, there can be difficult issues around that, such as, for example, a person who's had a head injury who may recover capacity in a relevant time. And again, if you're faced with those, those sorts of tricky scenarios where things aren't clear cut, then do call us and we're happy to advise on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, we'll move on now to a second scenario and again, this is a type of thing that we commonly see is, as, as people are obviously trying to fit increasing their health care around their lifestyle. So, um, and again, this isn't a specific complaint, but one that's a, an amalgam of themes that we have seen. To say, here, I'm a busy man commuting to London every day. I took a day off work to attend an outpatient clinic appointment. I waited over an hour before the doctor saw me. He ignored my rash and seemed more interested in the pain in my back. He said I needed a blood test. It was too late in the afternoon to do one, and would have to come back. Eventually, the doctor reluctantly agreed to take the blood test himself. 
don't know when he last took a patient's blood, seemed very unsure, now I have a huge bruise. My wife phoned the secretary for the result, but she would not tell her when I next attended the clinic six weeks later. I was told that specimens had been mislaid. I now have a test result, and my calcium level is higher. A and the letter then goes on. Um, so, again, what thoughts do you have about this complaint? I think last time you raised some very sensible points about that you, know, you need to investigate what happened here, talk to all the people involved and put it together. Here, um, can I say, what, what, what do you think the issues are, are here in this complaint? You know, it's, it's one that, that, that has perhaps got a, uh, is a bit more wordy, it's got a few more issues in it. Tell me what you think. So I've got here um, a comment here saying, look, a series of events went wrong. Um, calcium level was delayed by 24 hours. Well, I think here the original sample was lost and, and the chap comes back and, and, um, uh, and needed to have another test. And I think a comment here is, is that the patient feels frustrated and perhaps unheard. And I think that's right. There's clearly a, a frustration in this chap who believes he's done everything to get things right. Uh, there may be some systems issues here. And somebody said some communications are, uh, issues here as well. Um, and again, somebody said, sounds confused, and I think that's probably true on both sides, that there's perhaps a misunderstanding on the part of the patient as to how the system works and how to get the results back, and, and clearly the outstanding result hasn't been chased up either. Uh, and again, there's a comment raised here about raising and dealing with unrealistic expectations, and I think that should, that's true. I think another comment here, which is very sound, saying that, that you know, there are multiple issues, and each individually might not have generated a complaint, but taken as a whole, it's a real problem, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, <coughs> and you've got lack of follow-up bloods, clearly, you know, it's an unacceptable patient experience, and I think that's right, that from the patient's perspective, one can understand um, why the patient is unhappy, although, you know, it's not necessarily the case that anything has done, any, you know, anybody has done anything um, terribly wrong in, in, in dealing with, with that. Uh, and that we've got here multiple issues and perhaps unrealistic expectations. Um, and I think, you know, and another comment here saying that, that there is frustration because of the delay in clinic. You know, that, that perhaps the fact the patient had to make in the first instance is not, um, you know, is a feature that's led to some of the other complaints. Uh, and a comment here saying a, a bruise is not uncommon after sampling, and again here a lot of the things saying a lot of things didn't quite go right, and there's poor patient experience and a comment uh, a complaint as a result of that. I think those are all really helpful comments, and I, I'll try and draw those together a little bit. Um, I think firstly, you know, as you've all identified, there are multiple elements to this complaint, and maybe there are multiple little things that have led to the complaint. You know, it is perfectly reasonable to look at this sort of complaint with a significant event because there are different elements to it, some of which um, are simply recognized complications, etc., and others which you, know, you, you might think about um, improving in terms of, say, follow-up of results or how waiting times communicated with patients. Um, but as a lot of you have said here, I think it's important to look not only at the areas of concern but also the positive points. As some of you have identified, clearly it was appropriate that the uh, receptionist did not share the patient's information with his wife, you know, unless she previously consented to that. Um, and of course here the doctor did go out of their way to take a blood test in a surgery that was already running late. The patient got a bruise, but as has been said, that's a recognized complication. You know, there may be issues here, however, that could be uh, improved. You know, there may be an issue about, you know, um, identifying blood tests or samples that have, have failed. Um, and if you identify those, as we've said before, try and specify the actions to be taken and by whom, and, and set a review date so you know that, 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 that that's been dealt with. So I think, right, there, there's lots of um, issues in that complaint, and, and I think you've identified all those entirely appropriately. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, um, is meetings with complainants. Now, I've um, put this here because, of course, it's, it's th sometimes something we, we, we consider when, when a complaint can't be resolved, but it can also be something that's appropriate to do at, at the outset. You know, um, when you have a, a complaint that falls under the complaints regulations, a so-called formal complaint, 
then you will ultimately have to issue a, a, a written response to the complaint, but it doesn't mean you can't have a meeting first and then perhaps write summarizing the contents of the meeting, etc. Now, some patients really prefer that approach. Others, particularly if they're very frustrated or upset at the consultation, such as perhaps that, that, that last chap, may be better dealt with having a written response that acknowledges the issues that went wrong, explains why some of the things you know, are inevitably the case, um, and, and allow some explanation and some time for everyone to, to, to sort of reflect on that before sort of moving to a meeting can be much, much more helpful. Um, so if you do go down the route of having a meeting with a complainant, I think it's helpful to agree areas for discussion. If you're doing that at the outset, um, you can do it, you know, you, you can do that by simply identifying the, the, the key issues in the complaint. Um, if it's after you've had an exchange of correspondence, it can be really helpful to identify the bits that, you know, have been resolved and, and there's agreement over bits that, um, you know, are amenable to discussion and also perhaps identify the things that you'll discuss, but where you may not be able to respond, let's say, for example, because uh, a patient and a doctor's recollection or the patient's recollection and the records are fundamentally at odds. So, you know, it's, it's worth, you know, doing that preparing an agenda and, and setting something, something down before you start it. So you have a framework for that meeting. Um, it can be helpful for complainants to be supported during meetings, maybe through a friend or a family member. Do consider the advocacy services that are, that are around, such as PALS and ICAS. They're not, um, in my experience, particularly disruptive and they can be extremely helpful in focusing a complainant on, um, on the issues that the complaints process can address. So that can sometimes be extremely helpful. Um, although facilities vary, sometimes um, organizations have access to a conciliator, and that can be helpful, particularly when you have those intractable things. And sometimes having a clinician that's relatively independent of the scenario could be someone from the practice or the organization, but someone who wasn't directly involved in the scenario could be helpful. The other thing to say is after the meeting, record and agree the minutes. You know, it's helpful to have a record yourself, but also make sure that, that, that everyone's had an opportunity to see it and comment on it. Now, sometimes there may be factual issues that, that, that you can agree amendments to. There may be an ongoing dispute. And, and if that's the case and, and you can't agree minutes, well, you know, simply you, you, you keep your version of the minutes and any comments or disagreement the patient has a, as a record, but at least it shows that that, that that's been out in the open after the meeting itself. So, you know, that that's that it can be helpful. What I always think is it's it's really a matter, you know, it's it's really a thing for you as, as practitioners who know the patient to, to use your judgment to see whether a meeting will be helpful in a given case. You know, there are, there are times where, where patients can be very aggressive or the relationship's got to such a point where you don't consider it will be helpful and, and we would always you know, um, respect that. Um, but if you do go ahead to have a meeting, then make sure you're, you're properly prepared for it. Um, now, the final thing I want to, to, to talk about in a technical sense is, is really, look, what do you do once you've, um, once you've issued your response? That's what to discuss any outstanding issues. Uh, but in a technical sense, all complaints must be signed off. What that means is is is, is that um, the complainant must be advised when you know local resolution has come to an end, and they must also be advised of how they can seek independent review by the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. Um, and actually, including that information in 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 the fight, you know, in the sign off to the complaint doesn't depend on the seriousness of the complaint. It's a requirement of the complaints regulations um, for every NHS complaint. Um, you know, um, and the Ombudsman um, is, is independent of the NHS, they are empowered to review NHS complaints and they normally expect to receive requests for review within 12 months of when the patient became aware of their concerns, but they can use their discretion to look at things at a later time. And again, we've got information on our website about Ombudsman's reviews. The, the, the only thing I would say further about that is, is that part of the reason for going through a proper complaints process and, and, and dealing with, with things professionally, even when you know the matter really can't be resolved uh, and the complainant is angry or even being frankly unreasonable, is that, is that you know, 
essentially if, if it is reviewed by an external organization such as the Ombudsman or there's a GMC complaint, of course they will judge things on, on what they can see on paper, they won't have that direct experience of the complainant and, and having you know, evidence that you've, you've dealt with things really professionally and properly can be really helpful in avoiding criticism in any of that kind of process. So finally, Um, I, I'll deal with this question first before I move on and say if a simple letter has been sent addressing the complaint and you've had no formal response to that, how can you sign the complaint off? I would say actually the, the, the onus or, or the, um, the, the requirements for sign off um, arise from the, the NHS complaints regulations and essentially they sort of say what you must include in your letter is essentially um, you know, an account in response to the complaint, any, any sort of feedback of learning points or changes that have arisen from it, and also a requirement that you let the complainant know uh, of how they can seek independent review of it. So the onus is, is on the, uh, the body handling the complaint rather than the complainant coming back to you and saying if they've got unresolved issues. Essentially, you can do that in a straightforward way. Either you can issue your letter and, and send a letter after a period of time you know, saying that we, we presume you're happy, but in case not, you can contact us on this or approach the Ombudsman. Or you can simply add a sounded form of words at the end of your letter or in a covering letter saying that, you know, I, I hope this letter addresses your concerns. If you have further questions, you can contact on, us on this letter. It's also our duty to, to let you know that you can approach the Ombudsman for um, review of this matter and, and giving some more detail of that. And we'll often, if you certainly write to us, we will often, um, you know, assist you in preparing that sort of form of words for it. So th the fact you're signing it off doesn't mean at that point you must say, look, I will never speak to you again about this complaint. But it, it's simply that at some point in the process you should really, uh, and, and sort of, you know, in relation, when you issue your response, you should um, let the complainant know that they can seek review if they're dissatisfied. So, so moving on to that, um, we'll talk a little bit about how to avoid complaints. Um, not things I think you'll find surprising, and I'll emphasise again that, that you know we all expect to receive a number of complaints during our career. You know, maintaining good communication, keeping good clinical records, helpful not only in avoiding complaints but also responding to that. Um, we've got here involved service staff in, uh, sorry, senior staff in service development. What I mean is, is that is that if, if you've had an occurrence and something has gone wrong, then make sure that you, you've got somebody who's got, um, um, got ownership of the problem and um, drives it, it sort of being resolved. So if you identify an issue with follow-up of results or appointments and you think, well, look, this needs fixing, and make sure there's somebody who's senior enough to be able to, to, has got the authority to deal with that. Medical supervision of staff and of course of, 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 of junior medical staff dealing with things and take guidelines into account by that. I mean of course you know many guidelines are, are now available, or practically all of them are publicly available and often when you are responding to a complaint um, you know, a patient will, will already have read those and say, well, what about this, that, and the other? So when you're responding to a complaint, of course, take those into account when you're explaining why you acted in the way you did. And of course, have them readily available and make sure that you're, you're you know, following those or certainly recording departures from them when you're making referrals and, and managing patients. Again, of course, you must work within your competence and expertise. Most of our members are very sort of conscious of that and are obviously conscious of the need to keep up to date. And of course, gathering evidence that you've kept up to date can be, can be really helpful as well. Uh, and again, that's particularly important when you've got patients who you've obviously have a, a much broader access to information than, than perhaps they've ever had before. Yeah. So that's really what I wanted to say about um, complaints, and we're running to time, so, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, so um, if you've got any complaints there on that seminar, on complaints in general, then please do put them through and I will try and uh, deal with them as they come through.
I've got one here saying, do all complaints need uh, to be notified to your defence organisation? Uh, we'd say no, um, and we certainly, you know, if you, if you look at the complaint statistics, then the NHS has, you know, in excess of probably 100,000 complaints over, over that time. Um, you know, and we certainly don't expect our members to tell us each and every time they have a complaint. We encourage them to involve us in a, at an early stage so that we can, we can deal with, uh, with complaints. Uh, we can help you deal with complaints and help you with responses. It's not a requirement. Of course, if you're the subject of a claim, um, and, and of course we'll be handling that for at an early stage. Um, so I've got here, uh, can you give any advice on managing vexatious complainants when the complainant is keen on further escalation? Um, <clears throat> and, um, and I've got a, another question here which I think, I think is linked to that, is do we involve ombudsmen when local procedures are exhausted? Well, I think there are a couple of issues there. I think you, you've got to take a fairly neutral view about whether, complain, you know, whether complaints get escalated or not. Fundamentally, that is in the hands of the complainant, uh, and I think all you can do is manage the, com the complaint um, professionally, advise the complainant of their right to seek independent review, and if they, you know, if they um, um, take that up, then of course, you know, get in touch with us. We can we can help you with that. In terms of vexatious complainants, I, I think there's a couple of things there. The, the first thing is 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 that. It, you know, if you mean by vexatious somebody who just won't let go of an issue, well, that's where drawing a line underneath it, explaining that local resolution has come to an end, that you can't meaningfully add to it, and referring to the, them to the ombudsman is, is, is sensible. Where you've got repeated complainants on the same issue, I, I would encourage you to get in touch with us to, to discuss that on a case-by-case -case basis. I think you've got to have a fairly high threshold of labeling a complainant as vexatious. But where you've got a, a scenario where the complaining is getting to such a point Point that you, you can't you know have a meaningful relationship with that patient or uh, manage their clinical care and you're in the realms of thinking you know whether you should remove that patient from their list then take specific advice because um, of course you, you mustn't remove a patient simply because they have complained but, but of course that's slightly different from the scenario which I think is being presented here where, where you can't sort of be on that. Um, so I've got here one family that I've interacted with after a complaint management issue resulted in death and I felt that uh, purely factual response was a symptom of not caring. Do you have uh, any advice on how to address this or explain it in advance? Um, I would say that the, the, the factual response is, is kind of like the core of your response so that you've got a clear account of what happened that can form the basis for discussion around it. It's rarely all, you know. It's it's rarely um, the 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 be all and end all of a response. It's, it's just if you like the backbone of it, you can of course be conciliatory and explore condolences, etc. At the beginning, and you can of course after that give an analysis of why you think what happened, what could have been done better, etc. Show that you've reflected and and dealt with a factual scenario and, and made changes. Um, um, <clears throat> so, and, and again, I've got another commentator saying, do, do you need to notify us of all complaints, even if so, so locally? No, you don't have to tell us about all complaints, but we'd encourage you to contact us with any questions because we're really happy to dealt with them. Uh, um, so with informal complaints that you deal with verbally, uh, the complainant seems satisfied. Is it worth putting together a response and giving it in writing? Well, there's no obligation for you to do that. There's nothing to stop you doing it, and there's nothing, of course, for you to, you know, uh, and we'd encourage you to keep a log of those sorts of oral complaints so you can identify themes and deal with those if you need to. So I've got here, even if the local lawyer gets involved, ultimately there will be a barrister above him. Who is going to be reasonable? Who is wrong? Well, often lawyers are involved in complaints, and, and, and that may herald that there's going to be a claim, and if the claim goes as far as a trial, then the barrister will, will, will be involved in that. I don't think that necessarily affects how you deal with a complaint. Um, if you're concerned that, 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 uh, you know, that a claim is inevitable from that, then certainly get in touch with us and we can take that into account when we, when we advise you on a response. It's not, um, you know, in general terms, it doesn't make a lot of difference and the pitfalls are really speculating on things like outcomes rather than, um, you know, dealing with, um, with the issues in the complaint itself. 
The other theme I've got here is how to appropriately respond to unjustified complaints from patients with some form of psychiatric problem. Um, there's some really interesting information on the Ombudsman's website about this, and it is well recognized that, that psychiatric patients will often have paranoid ideas and conspiracy beliefs. In the nub of that, there may be issues that, that, that are legitimate complaints, and, and these can be incredibly difficult letters to read because they're closely spaced, rock written. There's lots of those, uh, you know, and lots and lots of pages of it. I think the key skill in that is, is looking through the complaint in an even-handed way, identifying the issues that are, are specific and correct and dealing with those, um, you know, and, um, and I think you can also, um, you know, you can, of course, um, explain what, why, when the complaints aren't reasonable and, and, and when, when, when you don't believe they have a basis. So we've got, um, and I know there's a question about um, the sign-off process, and I will, I will come back to that. Um, is there a specific time limit for the response to the complaint? Well, in general terms, um, the uh, complaints regulations require that you respond in a timely fashion. Now, that doesn't set out an absolute time limit, although it says you must keep the complainant updated of, um, of the progress of the complaint. And if it's significantly delayed for six months or more, you must tell them exactly why that's happened. Now, again, <coughs> we would expect that the vast majority of complaints will be dealt with in, you know, in a few days, a few weeks, etc. The key there is communication and managing expectation. If you get a complaint that says, look, you know, I've got concerns about my care from 10 years ago, uh, and this, 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 and the other, it may take you a lot longer to respond to that than somebody who simply complains that their appointment was delayed. Um, you know, including com uh, complaints sent to the authorities or the GMC, well, um, <clears throat> I mean, that, that, that could, could be a complaint, you know, a whole seminar in itself. The only thing I would say there is, look, go back to, to, to the point we made about multiple jeopardy. All these documents you, 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 you write, you know, the notes and the responses to complaints can be uh, looked at in another process. So make sure that they're as good as you, you, know, you want them to be. Um, what about a patient that writes uh, a litany of issues and one complaint, everything was wrong? We, we see sort of plenty of those, particularly with hospital complaints, where you see people complaining about what happened from the moment they entered the car park to the moment they left. There's no easy answer to those. They are difficult to investigate. I think you have to break them down, look at each of the stages, look at the information you'll need to get from each, you know, and how to investigate it and, and deal with that in a systematic way. Is there anyone you can use as a neutral mediator with a very aggressive, angry family member who just won't listen to any explanation you can try to give? Well, that's where a formal conciliator and some, um, some local area teams have access to those and some hospitals have access to those can be helpful. And, and it can even work where a conciliator will go from one room to another, explaining the position, explaining the other. If you've really got somebody who simply won't listen, then I would say, look, you might want to think about whether a meeting is appropriate in the first instance. Um, you know, so so you know that, that's that's that sort of important. Um, any advice about seeking to peer support me complaint in the scenario of a, a, a locum doctor frequently changing departments? But that is very difficult. I mean, I think if if you're if if you do have access to a trusted colleague, then then that can be appropriate. Um, you know, you can certainly talk through complaints in an anonymized fashion with other colleagues. You know, come to us; we'll, we'll very happily you know talk you through that. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is always helpful if, you, if you've got someone who, who, you know, you worked with at the time you think is appropriate, then that's helpful. So in the hospital setting, if a complainant has, has made multiple complaints, so much so that the therapeutic relationship has deteriorated, can you insist on referring them to another member of the team or a different hospital? Well, the thing I would say to that is, that of course, the GMC tells us that we can't end a professional relationship with a patient simply because they've complained. Now, this isn't simply because they complained, it's simply because you, you have no therapeutic relationship. Um, and there could, could be a justification for doing that. It's important that it's handled appropriately and the care is transferred in an effective way. Um, but sometimes, if you're in a hospital setting, it can be helpful if somebody else or the organization or the clinical lead steps into that and says, look, you know, we don't think this is appropriate. We don't think, you know, you're going to... You, this is a functioning relationship, so we are transferring you. That can, if, if your organization is willing to be involved in that way, and in my experience they often are, that can be, be sort of helpful. So happy patient, unhappy family. Does a complaint stand if the patient has capacity? 
I think you've got to be careful then in that complainants are often, you know, patients are often happy with you on a day-to-day -day basis. The key here is if the patient has capacity, do they give authority to the complaint? If they have given authority to the complaint and haven't withdrawn it, well, the complaint would still have to, um, to, to stand. On the other hand, if the, complaint, if the patient says, look, I don't want my family to bring a complaint, I'm happy with the service even if they're not, then, of course, you know, you're, you're limited in that. You know, they're, they're, they can't bring a complaint on the patient's behalf. You can, of course, with the patient's permission, provide an explanation to the family if that helps resolve the, um, the, 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 um, the matter. So I've got here, isn't it appropriate that your local facility gets back to you in writing after dealing with the complaint made by a patient against you uh, and your response and submission stating your involvement with the patient? Um, I'm not sure I quite get all of that, but I think what, what you meaning is, is look, if you've, if you've, if they've dealt with a patient, if you've been involved, should they let you know what the response was and what the outcome is? I would agree, yes, that is, you know, appropriate, but it does, you know, there isn't necessarily a positive obligation to do that. When you're, you know, a locum or you're moving between posts or you're going um, from different places, um, I think it's, it's really important that you, um, you know, maintain touch with the organisation who's got the complaint and say positively, look, I, you know, I want, I want you to keep me updated, um, you know, let me know um, what happens, let me know if you get any further correspondence and, and make sure you're kept in the loop. So I've got here, do you have any advice for short-term locums to handle complaints against them when, say, they, they have to leave the UK after the locum? Um, again, I think the simplest way is to maintain some communication, you know, um, make sure that, you, you know, if, you, if you're advised of a complaint, you say, look, this is how you can contact me. Uh, and, of course, they should give, you know, be clear as to the timescale in which you can respond because, of course, it may take longer to deal with those things. Uh, what can you do when the trust wants to settle when you as a clinician uh, consider it wrong, um, uh, if not a uh, misdiagnosis or clinical treatment? I guess it dep depends when you say when the, when the trust wants to, to settle, um, because that's, that's language that I recognise from the claims context more. Um, if um, you can obviously put your thoughts to the trust, in terms of, of claims, fundamentally it will be the trust and the NHSLA that the claim is made against, and unfortunately it will be ultimately up to them whether they settle a claim or not. And of course a trust may settle a claim for all sorts of other reasons such as litigation risk and, and the potential costs of it. Um, all I think you can do is, is explain quite clearly why you think that's not appropriate. I've got here to say, um, you know, could you please say who to talk to once we get a complaint as a junior doctor? Well, often speak to your educational or clinical supervisor. The complaints department in the trust should be involved as well because when a complaint like that comes in, then it's the organisation that overall has a duty to handle it properly. So make sure that's calculate, escalated um, as well. Um, so what do you do if the complaints department requests a statement from a junior doctor when the consultant says they should, uh, only they should be writing statements? Um, there's no, you know, a, a, the obligations when a complaint comes in is that the complaint is properly investigated, and that can include raising statements from anybody. Um, it's not necessarily the case that, the, 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 that only the consultant should be involved. Naturally, all those people who were involved in the scenario or complained about might be approached for a complaint. In some instances, a consultant with the agreement of the complaints department say, no, look, you know, have a chat with me and I will, I will deal with that, and, and that's perfectly reasonable, providing you have input into that. Um, you know, but, but I think that, 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 that it is important to make sure that you have some involvement. So, you know, your, your viewpoint, uh, you know, is, is important. You know, how to respond to a delay in seeing a patient on a dizzy day when there are only two dots in the department? Well, I think it's important that you, 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 um, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to put those issues in when responding to a complaint. I think the, the, the point there is, is that often, you know, also we'll say, look, this was a really busy day, etc. And the question I would say is, look, do you consider that had an impact on how you cared for that patient? If it did, then include it. Of course, don't give any uh, clinical details of the other patients in there, but explain what the context was. In other circumstances where you say, look, no, I, I was busy, but I, I still think I would have done what I did. But, um, you know, so, so make sure you focus it on that. On, on, on that. Um, so, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, patients are happy. Is this generally true whilst the complaints are ongoing? Percentages, thanks. You know, that, that is absolutely right. You know, the vast, you know, there are over, what is it, a million contacts a, a day in the NHS. The, the complaints are very rare in that context. That's absolutely right. Um, 
putting it, uh, his wife doesn't want any further investigations, his parents demanding to see the coroner's reports, etc. Is it okay to refuse for them to see it if the wife has asked you to not to pass it on? Well, I think in that specific context, it's the coroner's report. So if someone requests it, I would actually, um, you know, direct them to the coroner and say, look, you can seek the request from the report from the coroner themselves. In terms of um, disclosures after death, this can be a complex area, and essentially the person with the authority to, to uh, authorise access to records after a patient's death is the executor of, uh, of the patient's estate, uh, who may be the wife, who may be another, you know, the spouse, who may be somebody else. So if a person has their authority, then with a number of caveats, that, that information can be disclosed. Next of kin can't necessarily um, veto that. Um, I think, you know, in, in this context, you know, I would also get in touch with us because there can be complexities to it. So, for example, somebody who has a claim after a death might also have a right of access to the records. And I think a lot of the skill in those issues is not, not necessarily the medical legal points, but rather how you work your way through a, a, a dispute between the family and try and push it back for the family to resolve rather than you. So if a locum gets a complaint, will the NHS Trust still help a locum doctor or locum agency deal with it? Well, if the complaint relates to care at an NHS organisation, uh, then it's that organisation that has the responsibility to respond. Um, where, how helpful the organisations will be will vary quite a lot. Um, they should certainly contact you and, and, and you should submit your response through the organisation. And of course, come to us and we can assist you in preparing that response. Um, can you discuss a complaint with some other consultant who is not directly involved in the treatment? I think you can. You can do that in an, an anonymized fashion. If I do a patient with a consultant, patient complaints after that particular procedure, who's responsible to answer? Well, as with all these things, it depends on the scenario. Of course, the consultant's responsible for properly supervising a junior doctor. If the complaint is, say, that they don't like the way that somebody spoke to them, then, of course, that individual is going to have to answer to that. Um, and again, would it breach confidentiality of patient if you discussed it with somebody else outside the team? Well, you can do that in an anonymized fashion, and hopefully that won't. On an issue concerning chaperones, you require chaperones to put a signature in those rather than how remember that you actually chaperone in some uh, patient. Well, there is a specific GMC guidance on chaperones, and essentially you should record uh, that a chaperone was present and who that was, and that's, I would say, as much for your protection as the patient's. And of course, also, um, note down who the, um, you know, note down where a chaperone was offered and declined as well. So in the last minute, if I go back to the issue of sign-off, I would say that the, the, the key thing about that is, is that all complainants must be advised of their right to seek independent review from the Ombudsman. That doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that um, you're, um, you're banned from communicating with them. Um, patients after that, but just ensure that that information as to how they can seek review goes in your final, in your final letter. Um, so I think I, I've dealt with those. I'm just going to have a quick look through the questions again just to see if I've missed anything else in the last minute. I've got a thing saying, can we have a copy of the talk? I think it will be on our website, so I think you can, you, you can, there will be a copy of the webinar, and uh, there's one from a, the, it's very similar one I did a little bit, a bit before, so it's there. Uh, if one is asked to give an expert opinion on a complaint, um, should this be declared in revalidation? Well, if it's not a complaint about you, not necessarily, but I, I think the issue there, there is that you've, you know, if it's part of the scope of your work that you're giving expert reports, etc., then then perhaps it should it should use that. You should use that.
ความฟังนะครับโชคถูก